Hello there. Amao Kabuafo used to barely sell his art for $100. Now, an art market report may explain why the Ghanaian has become one of Africa's most popular contemporary artists. Boafo's painting Baba Diop reached $1.14 million at an auction last year. That makes him the number one artist in Africa's contemporary auction scene in 2021. According to Art Price, the Black Lives Matter movement had an impact on his rise. The organization's report says the movement forced American museums to recognize that their collections have a severe lack of diversity. And that means several began focusing more on art from black artists. Let's speak now with art consultant Anwari Musa. Hi there, it's good to have you with us today on Showcase. So I want to start with how influential the Black Lives Matter movement has been on the on this rise uh, in interest in African art. I mean, we've been hearing about the rise even before that, I would say, but uh, would you say uh, Black Lives Matter had a significant impact on the figures? Uh, yeah, no, absolutely. Um, when you think about Black Lives Matter and you think about the arts, um, it's important that artists um, speak for the time and also that when it comes to artists speaking of the time, that they do it in a way that's recognizable with not only um, in their work, but also in their practice and letting the public understand that when it comes to um, justice reform, wh well, whether it's justice, uh, justice reform or equal rights, um, that it speaks daily into the conversation of the work. And I think artists of this generation um, really uh, tapped into that conversation. Okay, well, would you say that the content changed? I mean, what artists are producing uh, changed after Black Lives Matter, or is it just the same kind of productions, but there is more interest? Um, I think the content was always, was always there. I think that Black Lives Matter and the movement made it more recognizable, not only in a, um, a domestic scale, but also in an international scale. Um, a lot of the artists that we think about, I know um, when we talk about Black re Renaissance, it's been in conversation and I think about our history, I think about the Harlem Renaissance where it was a particular time where it was talking about equal rights and um, the, the movement of Black arts. Okay, uh, speaking of, you know, talking about equal rights and uh, perhaps, you know, tackling stereotypes and um, relations of domination, et and uh, etc. Do you find it maybe sometimes problematic, problematic that all black artists or African artists are expected to talk about these issues or tackle these issues uh, through their art? Do you think that this is the case with the rise uh, in African art lately? And if so, do you find it to be problematic? Um, I don't think it's problematic. I think it's a more point of uh, accountability. Um, and speaking um, about African artists, I think when you think about uh, African diaspora in a global region, I think there's many conversations that happen in um, African art, whether it's Caribbean art, whether it's art from Africa or African-American artists. I think there's many factors that um, talk about the conversations in those particular regions. And obviously because of Black Lives Matter, it's a important um, topic to talk about because it's not only happening here in America, but it's a conversation that's happening globally. I think um, when it comes to artists of the region of Africa, I think it's even more of a conversation because we think about West Africa getting dominated by you know the, the, the British um, colony, you know, back in the days, you understand the history of the context is actually the same conversation. And some would say that this, uh, the role that uh, African artists or black artists uh, are supposed to play in this conversation that you were mentioning, mm -hmm. to be a little bit restricted. Mm -hmm. um, restricted, yes, um, but only restricted because it's so much of a deeper conversation. And I think when it comes to black artists and obviously this black renaissance of or new generation of black renaissance in the art, I think that there's actually more conversation to talk about it because we are all, con it, we're all connected now, right? When we think about 
our generation, we're connected through technology. And I think technology is a fast growing um, influence in our world that is direct with the conversation or that you can be directly in conversation now with the artist practice as they either making the work or as they are um, presenting the work to the world. Okay. Um, do you think this change is happening on the facade or do you feel like the prejudice is actually getting uh, broken against African art? Because historically, African art has been, I mean, it was viewed as, you know, just crafts or just, you know, some artifacts mm -hmm. that were just cute mm -hmm. to look at, but that was it. Uh, do you feel like we're moving past that? Yeah, if we're moving past that. It's not just a moment. It's... Um, it's 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 the world catching up to the conversation of the African art. Um, if you think about you know Picasso, he was heavily influenced in you know the art um, of black art of, of African art, um, and it shows from that particular you know setting that African art has a major influence in not only African art but in all art in general, right? Um, if I think about the history of African art and how it got passed down um, generation by generation, um, I think that the newer generation is enhancing the conversation that our ancestors kind of um, was foreseeing or was talking about um, in the past. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, we don't have much time left, but um, are you happy with the amount of people in managerial positions and other powerful positions in the art world? Or does it just feel like black artists or black art, uh, you know, being accepted or allowed in an art world that is run by non-black people? Yeah. Um, when we think about, you know, historical value, right? Um, a major uh, forefront to that is uh, museums, right? Museums play a major part into stamping the historical moment of the particular artist. And when we think about the times um, of, let's say Basquiat, um, you know, he was a generational artist where the, the, the museum didn't catch on to the time of him, you know, being a great artist, right? So a lot of his art is in private collections. When we see now museums realize that mistake and now for stamping the black artists of this generation and making sure that they are um, in conversation with the institutions. Um, a lot of the museums, and I don't know if we read the uh, art prize report, um, when they did the study in 2019, there was only 1.2% um, of African art in these institutions. And now you're gonna see that grow very dramatic, uh, very dramatically, but also um, there's still a lot more um, that needs to be um, said and needs to be worked on. You know, 1% is not a lot. It needs to grow faster and higher. And I think um, these museums are now recognizing that. Okay, well, um, we don't have any time left, but I just want to uh, hear whether you, you have anything to say to museum directors, because you mentioned the major role museums are playing in this. Anything to say to them? Um, you know, for, you know, for what's going on right now, I think museums have seen it and they are in conversation as far as bringing more uh, black art professionals inside the space. Mm -hmm. And also, I think another conversation to be had is that not only that they are bringing art professionals in the space, but um, having ownership as well. Okay. Okay, well, noted. Anwari Musa, it was lovely having you with us today. Thanks a lot. Halloween is one of the oldest running horror movie franchises. Fittingly enough, October sees the release of the newest film in the series. And to weigh in on how it treats the franchise's legacy, Alijan is here. Thank you, Elif. What are you guys doing out here? Halloween Kills picks up where Halloween 2018 left off. It basically takes place on the same night. Both movies disregard pretty much the sequels of the franchise, and instead, they claim they're the heir to John Carpenter's original from 1978. But to be honest, they fail at it. 
John Carpenter basically wanted Halloween to be this somber drama masquerading as, you know, teen horror, basically. And, you know, to visualize that feeling and emotion, he reached back to German Expressionist cinema. Now, German Expressionist cinema had its heyday after World War I and relied on long shadows and, you know, like dark and moody lighting to set up the atmosphere, basically. And John Carpenter went, you know, that kind of look and feel for his film. If you remember the movie, he had this subtle sense of the camera, you know, and he had like an almost blackout, very dark lighting that pretty much added to the mystery and drama of the film. Now with Halloween Kills, you know, that blueprint of John Carpenter's, forget about it, it's gone. Instead, the film employs a dynamic, you know, camera technique, which actually makes it look like more like an action movie. The other thing that worked for uh, uh, worked in favor of John Carpenter's movie was its three-dimensional characters. You know, in it you had Laurie Strode. At the beginning of the movie she was this, you know, shy and introvert character who faces danger. And in the face of danger she became this courageous young woman and a leading lady. In Halloween Kills there is no character development, even though it's an ensemble piece. New York Times said there are no characters in Halloween Kills, uh, only dead people, and I agree. But the thing is, though, in the end, Halloween, you know, when you look at the overall package, is not a successor, a worthy successor. It's not an heir to the John Carpenter original. It feels more or less like a, a you know, cheap imitation, and we have tons of those already. And I'm sorry, but that's the way I look at it. But until next time, I'm Ali Jam Pamir. A New York artist has brought together more than 350,000 acrylic fingernails to create a light and neon pink mosaic. Sounds kitschy, but it's actually a tribute to survivors of the coronavirus pandemic. This work is called A Fountain for Survivors, and I've been making fountains for about five years, small indoor fountains, and Times Square reached out to me to make a fountain commission, and I thought, we've been through so much, so I want to honor survivors. We've all made it this far. So I wanted to make a fountain for survivors and house it inside of some sort of shell so that it wasn't exposed on the street because we've all been inside so I wanted it to be sheltered too. I started working with acrylic fingernails on a research trip to Vietnam. Um, because I found that I was really close to the source of where they're being made and I started collecting them um, as part of a study on black women's beauty and beauty products. So in my culture, nails are like not quite essential, but they're kind of essential to the complete package. Like once your nails are done, you know that you're polished and ready to go. Nails are what you do when it's time to maintain. So this is my monument to maintaining. Nails is that little special thing that you do for yourself, and uh, I think survivors need that. A London hotspot to pop music is reopening. This is not a COVID story. Instead, it has the makings of a hundred million dollars. Uh, we 
Lounge has this place because um, I think we could uh, set it up with kind of a jazz, blues club environment and the vibe. So that's the basic um, elements that go, are going into Back, back to Basics, uh, old blues, jazz, and soul music. British songwriter Leslie Bricuse has died at 90. He wrote Bond theme songs for Goldfinger and You Only Live Twice. Bricuse's work also included songs for the 1971 Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. He was the co-author of Feeling Good, a signature song for Nina Simone. And Bricuse won an Oscar for his 1968 Dr. Doolittle tune, Talk to the Animals. Canadian pianist Bruce Liu has won first prize in the Chopin Piano Competition in Warsaw. The contest goes all the way back to 1927. 87 pianists from all over the world attended this year's event. The competition was streamed live on YouTube and the competition's app. Quentin Tarantino has received a Lifetime Achievement Award at the Rome Film Festival. Italian horror filmmaker Dario Argento presented the award. Tarantino wrote and directed nine films, including Reservoir Dogs, Pulp Fiction, Kill Bill and Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. He won two Oscars for Best Original Screenplay for Pulp Fiction and Django Unchained. Ten colorful skulls inspired by Frida Kahlo are on display in Mexico City. The installation has opened in the city's Jardin del Arte Park. The exhibition titled Frida's Skulls is on display just ahead of Day of the Dead celebrations. Amazon Studios has released the first trailer for Being the Ricardos. It features Nicole Kidman as iconic comedian Lucille Ball. The drama is written and directed by Aaron Sorkin and tells the story of Lucille Ball and her husband Desi Arnaz overcoming a crisis. The release came only a day after Ralph Carmichael who composed the music for I Love Lucy, died at 94. The Frankfurt Book Fair is back with a public edition. Although the COVID-19 pandemic boosted book sales, the fair will see fewer exhibitors and authors due to travel restrictions and overall virus concerns. A number of presentations and events will be online. The transcontinental expedition of Little Amal has completed her passage through Europe. The three and a half meter puppet has reached the shores of the United Kingdom. Here's a look. She made stops in Rome to see Pope Francis and in Geneva to see the United Nations building. On the UK leg of her journey, she'll visit Canterbury, London, Oxford, Coventry, Birmingham, Sheffield and Manchester. Sarah Loder, general manager of artistic project The Walk, said. She represents all of the children who have had to leave their homes um, and are looking f with their family and some without any family um, for a new life um, outside of their country, looking for safety, looking for a future. We wanted to come to Folkestone and Dover to this very significant place where so many people start their journey for a better life, a new, a new life in the UK. We know that so many people have made this crossing and Little Amal represents all of, all of those people. Bob Marley is getting the musical treatment in London's West End. Here is a glimpse at the production about this reggae legend. A lot of people know Bob's music, but they don't know his story, his life, you know, and that's what we're doing here on the stage, you know, we're telling the entire story. It's 
trying to not make it so much of a biopic that it just kind of, you hit one moment, hit one moment, hit one moment. We're really trying to show the heart of the man, trying to show what really made him tick and why he made the choices he made. Um, his um, political leanings came out of his situation. And so we're trying to give the context by which a global, third world global superstar was born. quite magical putting on the locks you know I hadn't really put them on until we got to the theater and so we did all this character work and but without it you know and so I was doing the performance and I was just kind of imagining that I had long locks but um, but yeah it, it was great putting them on The 11th season of Curb Your Enthusiasm returns to television in a world where the decidedly unfunny pandemic has come and gone. What happened to the movie where you were playing me? Oh, the character God. was based on me. The long-running HBO cringe comedy Curb Your Enthusiasm is coming back for an 11th season. The word that kept reappearing was repugnant. Repugnant. The show's creator and star, Larry David, who plays a fictionalized version of himself, said the upcoming episodes were written during the health crisis, which wasn't a particularly funny time. We wrote it during the pandemic, um, but d didn't really do a pandemic show, so to speak. Uh, didn't want social distancing or people wearing masks. Kind of comedy killers. Hey, it's me. Where are you? There's traffic. The new season is set in a world where the pandemic is history. You have to have done something stupid to be in traffic. I don't belong here. A large part of that choice was due to production delays, and comedy can be all about timing. Here's executive producer Jeff Schaefer. When we were writing, we had to decide what's the weather going to be like in a year and a half. And we didn't want to start doing a whole bunch of COVID jokes and be the last person to the table. The cast got together at the Los Angeles premiere Tuesday night. The bespectacled Brooklyn-born David, who rose to fame after co-creating the critically acclaimed sitcom Seinfeld, didn't want to divulge any plot points. Well, the post-pandemic world was very similar to the pre-pandemic world. Very chaotic, and I cause a lot of problems for people, yeah. How do you know prayers don't work? Because I'm bald. The 11th season of HBO's Emmy-winning hit returns to the small screen on Sunday. The Ural Industrial Biennial of Contemporary Art is happening in Russia. The sixth edition's installation and performances are reflecting on what the world has been through, isolation and loneliness. If you look at this reflective floor, you'll see that we is reflected in me, which can be translated as I. Here, the play on words was very important. We and I. How we identify ourselves. How we see ourselves in society. And also during this pandemic. When this we abruptly changed into I, where we were left in loneliness, tete a tete with ourselves. The 17 new performances for this 360-degree environment, which we show during the biennial, is of course a very difficult experiment for us, because this is more a kind of theatrical production, a theatrical festival, 
We never did that, but now, of course, we feel the expansion of all kinds of our own boundaries. It's a piece about um, the fragility of the body and the resilience, how we cope with resilience nowadays. And um, also, we have to think also in relationship to the biennial and also where we are now in time, this feeling of like, um, have to be strong, not being in contact with one another and have to really um, develop this coping mechanism. That's it on this episode of Showcase. Our YouTube channel, Instagram and Twitter accounts have more from the world of culture and the arts. I'm Elif Bereketli, thanks for watching, bye for now.